Well, we just had uh, some difficulties with floods. And we know that for decades uh, we've been told that because we've had the changes in the way the weather patterns are attributed to climate change, etc., we need to be a lot more cautious. Well, it's also because the environment and its components are not being sustainable enough and are changing. And uh, talking about the environment, uh, today is World Environment Day. We need to do something to really mark the day beyond uh, the day to day issues that we see. And the World Environment Day is a day set aside by the UN Environment Program, the UNEP, to create awareness and action for the environment. And over the years, it has grown to be a broad global platform for public outreach that is widely celebrated by stakeholders in several countries. We're told over 100, so to speak. Well, uh, the day uh, also serves as uh, People's Day for doing something positive and just always governizing individuals and um, institutions to keep us reminding ourselves that really we need to do something about the way we live and the resources that we find in the environment. And today, uh, we have a theme for the year. It's seven billion dreams, one planet consumed with care. And um, I have with me a number of officials. We're here to talk basically about fish, fish stock, um, and whether we have enough, so to speak, just to put it simply. And uh, let me just do the introduction of my guest this morning. I have Peter Derry just close to me. And he is uh, a Deputy Director, Head of Climate Change and Sustainable Development Unit for the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology and Innovation. Thanks for joining me. And, uh, uh, well, yeah, sandwiching, uh, sandwich between them is Dr. Uh, Brian Crawford. Thanks for joining me, sir. Uh, Chief of Party. Is that your position? Or USAID or what they will be calling USAID. Around here we say USAID. Okay, so USAID, Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Project. And uh, thanks for joining us. The, the best expert as far as uh, undertaking the research and, and reading all the necessary materials about whether we have enough fish stock, we're creating the needed sustainable environment for it to be uh, sustainable over the period. And then Peter, uh, is also here with me. But uh, the last person I have to introduce is uh, Sam Healy. Uh, he has a, a middle name called Kent. <laughs> he doesn't want me to introduce it, but he's a first secretary of regional environment science and health officer for West Africa as well as for Central Africa, the US Embassy here in Accra. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Well, All right. And basically, <coughs> we're here to talk about uh, the fish stock and, 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 and whether we are doing well enough in our country, etc. Uh, but you are from our environment uh, ministry. Uh, do you think we're doing well enough as far as um, the fish stock we have? Have we been able to sustain whatever we have, etc.? Yeah, thank you very much, Roland. Um, I think that we are not maybe doing too bad, uh, but we haven't done the best mm. yet. Um, it is apparently clear that fixed stocks have been dwindling over the years, and uh, food security is generally a problem as far as this part of the world is, is, is concerned. But I'm saying that we, we, are not, we are doing considerably well because we have always had what we call incremental uh, improvements over, over the years. If you look at what happened uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago as to what we are doing today, you will see that there have been some improvement in terms of how our uh, fisher folks are using uh, the abort motors and in terms of the fishing nets that they are using and the kind of practices that we have. You will see that gradually there have been some improvement over the years. But of course we haven't gotten there yet. We are still far away from arriving. And so we still need to do, to do more. And uh, I think that for me, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of room, and uh, we have recognized that in, in our national policies, and a number of issues are in there that uh, if we get the necessary support and we, we put our acts together, we should be able to, to, to reach mm. there. And we, we did it. But we're, we're always talking about support, but we also need to be... Uh, but, but I know you wanted to add something to it. But talking about support, we know the U.S. Embassy, mm. uh, as always, uh, through its agency, the USAID, is always assisting in other interventions, other mm. through funding, um, through technical support, etc. Any kind of assistance projects currently ongoing? Well, we have the project that Brian's working on that's run through USAID. We've done some uh, two-week training recently with our National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration here that included a number of folks from Ghana, from the Fisheries Ministry, and from the Fisheries Commission, as well as folks from all around West Africa. So we're running trainings like that. We also uh, support Ghana in international fora, 
Um, there are a number of different treaty organizations or agreements that we have that that we that we sit on with uh, the, with Ghana, and so we work together quite closely with Ghana. Mm. <coughs> excuse me to help uh, to help improve the the facilities and the uh, you know the different agreements that we have that are worldwide on things like tuna on whales. Um, those those kind of uh, issues that we work strongly. Um, mm, I, I remember just two days ago, I just listened on the BBC that, uh, uh, as far as uh, the shows around Holland is concerned or the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, mackerel uh, uh, fishing was not uh, getting the support that it needs because they don't have enough stock in there. But is it is <coughs> it because you're giving all the support? as a result of research that has been undertaken and so we found out that we have really great needs that need to be supported well you, exactly you look at you look at the fish stocks offshore here in the gulf of guinea and they're some of the richest in the world there are a number of sort of climatic and ocean situate uh, conditions there that that make it a very rich fishing ground and it is both near shore which is what ghana usually fishes in and i think that uh my my friend to the right here can explain this in more detail <laughs> because he's actually the expert Rachel. but um but uh, that 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 has attracted a lot of foreign fleets, both Ill legal and illegal. And so one of the big threats to the fish stocks in the world, particularly with the fish stocks diminishing around developed countries, is um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, that we see a lot of that in the Gulf of Guinea, um, off of Ghana, off of the countries from Angola, clear up to Mauritania. So I think that's, a, mm. that's something that we all need to work on. And, and that will be, if we can get a handle on that, that will be a, have a major impact on the sustainability of the fisheries. Mm. And being part of, uh, and being in charge of this project, the Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Project, you may have undertaken a number of research activities. Uh, well, there's been a lot of uh, study. Not necessarily perhaps a survey, but um, yeah. some ob observational activities right. that are through interactions mm -hmm. and things. Well, what have you found out? Yeah, well, the Fisheries Commission does um, is, you know, t monitors the uh, fish stocks, and particularly for the small pelagics, the ones that are smoked and are very important for food security here in Ghana, and as Peter mentioned, um, uh, are important for food security. Uh, the situation is actually quite dire. Uh, a decade ago, um, Today, in fishermen were harvesting over 100,000 metric tons of fish per year, and now that catch of those stocks is down to around uh, 30,000 metric tons per year. Why? Well, part of the problem, as mentioned, is uh, illegal fishing, um, but that's not the only part of the problem. And I think one of the challenges is that over the last 10, 20 years, the number of Ghanaian fishermen and the number of fishing boats that are here has increased dramatically. Um, also, Ghanaian are some of the best for fishermen in the world. And they've had improved technologies uh, and larger gears, larger boats that they're using. So we're in a situation where there's significant overfishing occurring, where we just have too many boats and too many fishermen chasing too few fish in the sea. So they've actually harvested so many fish that we're not leaving enough fish in the ocean today to produce the next generation of fish that we can harvest tomorrow. Mm. So one of the things that needs to happen is, and it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, is that we actually have to fish less today and reduce kind of our harvesting capacity so that we can have more abundant harvests uh, in the future. Mm. Well, since, since you, you are in charge of the project, I have to ask you a, one more question. So it means that what are you doing to make sure that is undertaken? Uh, make sure there's um, uh, less fishing, so to speak, so mm -hmm. that uh, you grow enough or mm -hmm. make sure you keep the needed stock for the future. Yes. Well, we're working very closely with the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development and the Fisheries Commission. Uh, we've uh, put together a science and technical working group that is doing more studies to get a little bit more uh, specific handle on how the magnitude of the problem and really what needs to be done. But the other thing that we're doing is we're working with a lot of partners here in Ghana, local local groups and including government, and particularly the men and women involved in the fishing uh, industry itself. And we'll have a series of dialogues to kind of talk about what the problems are. But uh, if you go out into the fishing communities and you talk to fishermen and you talk to fish processors, they're all very much aware of the problem. And I think pretty much aware of what the uh, causes of the decline in the fishery is uh, both the use of lights and dynamite and just the overfishing problems. So what we want to do is, is facilitate dialogues with both government and stakeholders to look and see a way forward and are there uh, more sustainable fishing practices, more responsible practices that we can implement um, that will uh, rebuild the fish stocks and ultimately uh, increase the yields of fish that are 
available for mm. people here in Ghana uh, to eat. But what that means is we really need to involve the people themselves, the fishermen themselves, in being part of the solution and not just blaming them for being uh, the problem. So they have to also participate and agree and believe in the measures that need to be taken and then be willing to follow those measures to uh, improve their livelihoods as well. Mm. Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Fisheries, but also because the Minister of Environment is, is critical as well. Do we have any policy direction? Because all these uh, Brian is talking about should be premised on a certain policy direction and, and, and what is it? Sure. Um, sustainable development is, uh, <coughs> is is being hosted by the Minister of Environment, uh, Science, Technology, and Innovation, and of course, uh, this cannot be delinked from climate change. And climate change is also a portfolio that is being hosted at the ministry, which I, I, am, I am in charge. Um, if you look at the two policies that we have, uh, we have an environment policy and we have the national climate change policy. Both policies have identified uh, agriculture as a very key priority area for us to, to look at uh, in the short to medium term if we really want to transform this country, if we want to really address issues of climate change in terms of resilience and creating livelihoods for our community and also looking at mitigation. Because even the fisheries sector addresses uh, the two main issues of climate change, which are adaptation and mitigation. In terms of adaptation, we are talking about how can people cope with the impacts of uh, uh, climate change saying that they will still be able to meet their livelihoods and, and live decent lives. And of course, most of our communities are dependent on fishing, especially the coastal area, even, even up north and the Volta, where even we don't, there's no coast, they still depend on fishing. And so that's a, a critical area. Now, in terms of even emissions, uh, how fish is processed and all that can also lead to a lot of emissions. And so these policies are looking at how to address that. And of course, in doing that, then of course, you are also moving towards sustainable development. So there are policies and there are a number of uh, actions that have been identified in them. And even we have identified the institutions that will have to carry out some of the actions. Uh, the institutions that are leading the process, that are supposed to lead the process, and the institutions that are supposed to collaborate and support the lead institutions to make sure that what is happening is that uh, we have various sectoral policies and various institutional policies. What the environment policy and the climate change policy does is harmonizing all these policies and making sure that we work in such a way that we do not uh, con contradict each other and we do not duplicate efforts. So basically that is what uh, these two policies are. Mm. And uh, <coughs> maybe um, as we go along, uh, we can mention some of the few things that we mm. can have. Mm. Uh, and uh, what, as, as an embassy, mm -hmm. um, you, you get to do a lot more of the dialogue with, um, well, the intended ministries mm -hmm. uh, because it's more at uh, an intersectorial level. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you identified over the period that you feel as a program you can support um, for perhaps the next five years or a certain duration? So in my position as the regional environmental officer, I come with a lot of diplomatic uh, resources behind me, but not much in the way of uh, monetary resources. So what we can, what my what I can do is I can identify programs back in Washington that may be able to support activities or plans. Have in you Ghana. done that? Uh, yes. We, for instance, with the NOAA training that I just spoke about. I mean, that was something that that we worked closely with NOAA to try to get them out here because that's an important thing um, to, to do. We're also going to be working with the uh, Ministry of Environment. We've been talking with them about uh, where we might be able to assist on their preparations for the very important event that's happening in Paris in December, which is the 21st Council of Parties for the uh, United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is going to be a major meeting where the entire world will hopefully negotiate uh, set uh, emissions uh, levels for every country that is included in the negotiations and we're working with uh, uh, with Ghana to try to uh, figure out where we may be able to uh, help them to assist Ghana in, mm. in there both in, in preparing for the conference but also as, almost more importantly in where everybody goes after the conference because mm. once the conference is over whatever is decided there needs to be implemented and so it's important that, and I know Ghana has been, this has been a key issue for Ghana right now. I've talked, I, you know, my job is to go around to many different countries and talk about these issues. And I was just, I got back from Chad yesterday where I was talking to the government of Chad about their uh, preparations. And they're much further behind Ghana in terms of how they're thinking proactively about what to do after 
the conference in December is over. So I think that, you know, first of all, kudos to the government of Ghana for their preparations and for thinking that far ahead, but also that we can work with them to try to, try to see what, what we can help implement. Uh, in terms of uh, and, 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 and and when we when we when you tend to work and I do the identification of what uh, needs to be done in terms of what the uh, programs should be and mm -hmm. then that also will be perhaps fashion out in a policy it's not only about just doling our money right oh no no not at all but, but key is technical support but the, and, and exactly and that's 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 possibly where we, we could we could assist uh, we could assist the ministry and the climate change uh, team uh, is with technical uh, support because I mean, there are many very good technicians at the at the ministry and in fact much of what they've done so far has been completely sort of Ghanaian focused and and the it's it's great because mm. as I said I go to other countries and it's not nearly so strong the teams aren't as strong and mm. they're just not they're not as as high level as they are here so mm. I mean, it, a lot of for Ghana and the US it'll be a lot more of picking very specific issues that there may be some expertise in the US that isn't available in Ghana right. rather than this overall assistance because it's not needed here people you know the, the team here is already top-notch and so it, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and to just add that, even in the preparation of these policies, we involve our development partners. We don't wait to finish and then uh, we go to them. No, right from the onset, we make they, sure they, that they are involved. They are involved, All and right. then we they, they assist us to make sure that we come up. With well, good what, 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 one one phrase we can we can borrow though is homegrown, and uh, we've yeah. been using that uh, yes. this year a lot, yes. just because we went to the IMF. Though. But that's just by the side. But how long is the project you're running for? Uh, the Sustainable Fisheries Management Project is a five-year uh, initiative. When did so it start? It just started uh, this year. Oh, it just started? Uh, yes, so we're just getting going. And uh, one of the activities we'll be sponsoring under the project, along with other sponsors, the State Department uh, and some local NGOs of Rocha, is uh, an event tomorrow in Winneba in celebration of World Environment Day. And we were talking a little bit about climate change, and one of the things that we'll be doing is uh, working with the community to plant 1,000 mangrove seedlings. And mangroves are very, very important because they uh, sequester a lot of carbon. So by you know maintaining and sustaining mangrove ecosystems, we help to uh, reduce carbon emissions. Um, but also mangroves are important for other reasons. They uh, provide services in terms of preventing uh, flooding, uh, as we know, we had the tragedy mm. uh, yesterday here. You should advise our crown. people, they should stop yes. selling the lands yeah. where we have mangroves yes. to develop. So it's good to preserve <laughs> the mangroves, and then also right. the mangroves are also used for fuel and are used in smoking fish. Sure. So one of the other activities that we'll be doing is working with SNV Netherlands Development uh, Organization, which is one of the project partners is introducing more fuel efficient uh, fish smoker stoves so that hopefully that in the long term will help to reduce the mm. amount so the of interaction and the training etc how do mm. you ensure that by the yeah. close of the fifth mm -hmm. year you do enough technological transfer mm -hmm. or perhaps a technical transfer so to yes. speak in terms of knowledge expertise mm -hmm. and some skills yes well part of that is working with the ministry of fisheries and aquaculture development and making sure they're involved in that and they're learning those activities but also working with other local ngos so we're working with uh, the central and western region fishmongers association some other groups like development action association particularly in winneba and Upam, uh, that are associations of fishmongers and having them understand these new processing technologies and ultimately really having them promoting them among their members. Uh, so that will be a much more sustainable uh, approach in the long term so that even after the project ends then we uh, expect that those uh, activities and uh, those sort of technologies can be promoted by the local organizations and government. Mm. Now when I was giving um, the lineup for this uh, about two years ago, I, 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 well, I did a lot of reading. And one of the materials I came across was a material, I, th I guess, put together by a former minister, Sherayite, which also talks about aquaculture. Yes. Uh, how does aquaculture, because I know it's part of fisheries, mm -hmm. also dovetail into um, mm -hmm. the whole um, initiative of the project? Yes, if, if you are talking about sustainable development, you can do without aquaculture. Because if you look at the natural resources that uh, fish is, is currently dependent on, uh, in terms of the water bodies, they are, they are even dwindling. And, and, and like you said, because of the amount of activities carried in there, uh, <coughs> uh, we are not able to get the amount of fish that we expect. And it is easy to pollute the natural uh, uh, water bodies than 
when you have fish ponds and others because those ones are, are, are well managed because they're usually under the direct care of an individual and so uh, aquaculture is, is an area we need to look at. Another reason why we need to look at aquaculture is the fact that some of the fishes are getting extinct. We cannot find them. And so to grow them means that we will have to grow them outside the rivers, outside the ocean and all that. So yes, uh, aquaculture is an area we are looking at. And uh, um, um, of course, if you are talking about uh, enhancing livelihoods, you, and, and of course, if the, 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 the natural resource is dwindling, then of course, you must look for alternatives. And an alternative is to create them yourself and not to depend on a natural resource. And the only way to create them yourself is to do aquaculture. Mm. So that is how aquaculture comes into the, the, this whole uh, um, issue of uh, sustainable development and, and, and also climate change in general. Yeah. Mm. And as you work with the people, Dr. Crawford, uh, it, it means that in Ghana we have what we call the uh, local government system and so we have district assemblies metropolitan agencies and inherent in them are various departments and i'm sure uh, they, they have sub departments in the various regions and and districts etc uh, did you work with such people down there or you just go straight to identified groups and then they work with the market women etc without going through the local government system you do bypasses uh, no, uh, we certainly want to work with the local government units as well. And for instance, the uh, activity that's occurring in Winneba tomorrow for World Environment Day in is involving the district assemblies and those uh, individuals because we know those individuals have a lot of influence with the stakeholders, the fishermen, and the women uh, processors. So they have to be involved uh, in the process as well. So it's working with national government, local government, as well as the stakeholders and the, and the people on the coast as well. Mm. If you sit behind your desk, you go around well, areas in Ghana, you do the dialogue with uh, policy people across the sub-region, etc. Um, how, how do you take into cognizance the perhaps socio-economic uh, um, state of the populations you're dealing with? As, as those um, things tend to also inform you to be factored into policy. Well, uh, my, <coughs> excuse me, my job is pretty much at the national level. So, I, I, you yeah, so I, 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 I do get out into the field and I try to learn as much as possible. We take no, no, you don't have to go, no. but perhaps maybe you have data that has been given yeah, to no, you by no, people no, like by, Dr. By, Crawford. Well, by USAID and is, is, is our, sort of our, <laughs> th that's our network on the ground. And so they re we really rely on them for a lot of the information that we gather. But it is important to know what's going on in the, on the ground because that is what we can then go to the national policy level people both here in Ghana but also in the United States and say look this is an issue we need to help address this issue or we need to encourage people to address this issue or we need to say that's a great idea we should take the idea in Ghana and try to suggest that to other countries because this, this isn't just a question of diplomacy is not just us finding out what's going on in Ghana and trying to get Ghana to do things. It's also learning about what Ghana is doing well and trying to either bring that back to the United States or to share it with other countries. So my job, you know, I'm regional. I cover 24 different countries in Western Central Africa. I don't, you know, because of that, I don't get a lot of time to go to the local regions on a regular basis. But I do, I, you know, I've been out to Takarati, talk with folks out there. We meet up in, uh, you know, as much as possible, we try to get our feet on the ground in the field and learn about things and let that inform our uh, let that inform our diplomacy and our policies at a higher level so mm. well fantastic from you but uh, we know it's a project as you get to implement you get to know that well the there are certain variables you may have um, imagined on paper based on well actual data collected and so uh, well that should be real but you go onto the ground and it changes and this is not going to be the first project where things change as you practicalize them um, what is what mechanisms are in there so perhaps you see new things that you can then incorporate as the project goes on yeah well one of the things for instance like our what our local partners is doing is you know we talk about data and scientific information but equally important is local knowledge and fishermen are actually quite knowledgeable about the marine environment and the fisheries resources so one of the activities that we're actually doing is trying to capture some of that local knowledge by engaging with them and talking to them about you know where do the fish spawn what time of year do they spawn so as we think about what sort of practices we need to implement to make the harvesting practices more sustainable there's a lot of uh, information and knowledge that they have that they can contribute uh, to helping us understand better uh, how we can develop a much more sustainable 
uh, management practices here. Mm. Well, the sub, the local sub team chosen by the partners for the World Environment Day is uh, to suit the local context and resonate with the relevant target audiences of this uh, component. Our mangroves are fish, consume with care, and uh, well, you have given us the objectives. But you know that we we have we have discovered some little oil down there. Mm -hmm. But you yes. know. Uh, in many of the coastal communities, there are concerns by various NGOs and, and, mm -hmm. and, and various community organizations about mm -hmm. how the effects of all that spillages, and they have really been reported in Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, are those issues you would also be incorporating in the, in the next uh, five years? To, to some extent, yes. <laughs> and uh, particularly when you go to the western region and you talk to fishermen, the oil and gas issues. Because are the fishermen really really are concerned important. when we interact they are with concerned, them. Yes. And, you know, clearly um, if the oil and gas companies do not uh, also engage in responsible environmental practices, and if you do have oil spills, that will have significant impacts on the fisheries resources. So it is very important that the Ghana government work with the companies that are doing the offshore oil and gas development and exploration uh, and ensure that their environmental practices are sound. You know, we've had our own experiences in the United States with uh, major oil spills that have had uh, terrible uh, impacts on the fishermen and we would hope that uh, that same situation doesn't occur here in Ghana. Mm. Well we may not have it like BP or uh, any of them in the Gulf of Mexico and all of that but uh, little spills even if the, if, if the oil companies are more environmental mm. friendly and making sure that they undertake more sustainable activities to maintain whatever they do there still be little spills that we'll be concerned about. How do you make sure that doesn't uh, ho affect wholly the livelihoods of the fishermen that you will be working with in the, on this very project? Yes, the government of Ghana has developed uh, uh, <coughs> a spillage uh, response plan. And uh, in that plan, uh, we do regular cleanups, and, uh, monitoring and inspection. We don't really wait for emergencies to, to happen or care before we, we go there. And so the regular monitoring and, and, and cleanups that, 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 that we do as a result of the plan that the government has come out with ensures that the little spills that we are talking about are well contained and uh, where we have to take up certain actions to make sure that they don't even happen. We inform the companies that are concerned to do what is expected of them. So there's a plan because we have learned from countries like Norway and uh, Trinidad and Tobacco and other countries that are producing oil. And uh, one of the main things they realized was that the fact that some of these countries uh, that did not put in uh, uh, contingency plans to, 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 to take care of some of these. Well, these uh, plans really are for major spills. Yeah, We're not that, talking about major but, spills. But that's what I'm saying. That in our, that's, why, that's why I said in, in the case of Ghana, uh, it's not an issue of contingency. It's an issue of spill, uh, spillage uh, response. You know? And if you talk about spillage response, we are not waiting for an emergency. It is something that happens, like you are saying, there are small, small spills happening every now and then as far as production is concerned. And so in our plan, we have decided that no, we are not going to wait for that. We have regular plans. There's a time period that you need to go and monitor. And there are times that you need to even ask the companies to do cleanups. So they do minor cleanups. They don't only wait for major uh, occurrences before they do that. And so if you look at the detailed uh, plan that we have come out, and we did that actually with the assistance of the Norwegian uh, government. And so with all the experiences that they have gone through over the years, all the other things that uh, we could have easily occurred uh, have, been, have been in a way prevented. Uh, and that's why, apart from the initial uh, complaints of spills that happened, for some time now we haven't heard about uh, any spill mm. coming from... from did you before? Again, you're not getting me. I'm not talking about those spills. Uh, because, Dr. Crawford, you, you are the manager of the project, so let me ask you this. The point is, we have interacted consistently with the fishermen in the area. Okay. And we know that even though the activity of oil is happening 200 nautical miles mm -hmm. from the coast, they still have to go uh, a lot more outward from the shores mm -hmm. to go and fish. Because now, you, you are saying the technologies have improved. You're able to go deeper into the sea and do all that. But they're saying where the activity is ongoing, they don't get a lot more of the stock that they used to get. And you, you are oh, dealing okay. with stock. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, how yes. are you going to factor this in your interaction with fishermen in Takradi and, yes. and all that? Well, I mean, many fishermen talk about, you know, the oil rigs offshore, they have lights. And uh, just like the fishermen, they use lights to fish. So when you have lights, they attract fish. So some fishermen complain that all the fish now are underneath the oil rigs and 
there is a exclusion zone around the oil, security zone around the oil rigs where they're not allowed to fish. So they're very upset about that. Um, however, you know, the problem of depleted uh, fish stocks is not really uh, where oil pollution might be a contributing factor to that. Really, the, the, the problem is, is self-induced, and it really is too many fishermen, um, too much fishing power, uh, and the use of destructive fishing activities like dynamite and carbide, and the fact that many of uh, Ghanaian's uh, mm -hmm. fishing laws are not uh, well respected. So you see high levels of illegal fishing, uh, not only of kind of the offshore fleets or other fleets that may come into your exclusive economic zone, but also of Ghanaians themselves. So uh, uh, Ghanaians themselves need to uh, take uh, re responsibility for managing the resources and the fishermen mm -hmm. as well. And one of the ways that we would like to do that in the project is engage them in the process and in the dialogue so that they're part of the decision-making process. And if you look worldwide, when you involve fishermen into making the rules for how the fishery should be managed, then there's more likelihood that they'll obey those rules and follow those rules. And if we do that, then there's more likelihood that we can uh, rebuild those stocks and get back to uh, the higher yields and harvests that we once had here in Ghana. Mm. Since you started the project this year, have you started already start, uh, interacting with the, the groups, the fisher, the fisher folks and, uh, and the groups uh, in the fishing community? Yes, we've had a series of uh, launch events uh, that have been ongoing in many of the targeted communities, and we have planned for this year a number of dialogues that will occur in each of the coastal uh, regions, but also this project was a follow-on from a previous USAID project that worked in the primarily in the in the western region where we had a lot of activities over uh, four years to work with the fishermen and identify what those problems are. So what this project is trying to do is move from identification of the problem and the causes of the decline in the fish stocks to solutions. How can we, what is the way forward, and doing that with the fishermen and women uh, in the coastal communities. Mm. Do you know how much all this costs? How, how much is your government pumping into all this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the, oh, uh, right. the, doc right. the doctor right. about that's that. Right. That's I, I Dr. Dr. Crawford. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Crawford. Yeah. Uh, how much is how the project? How much does it cost? He deals with 24 countries. Yeah, exactly. uh, uh, well, the USAID initiative is a $24 million project. $24 million. Implemented over five years with match contributions from implementing partners like the University of Rhode Island. Uh, there's also another supporting project here. The World Bank also has a very large... Uh, uh, West Africa Fisheries Initiative that is um, given a loan to Ghana th to be implemented through the ministry for $40 million. So there's a, a lot of uh, external donor support that's going into the fishing industry right now and hopefully with that level of uh, external funding we can uh, get to a point where we uh, mm. have much better management of the fisheries resources. Uh, more abundant fish supply for people in Ghana and more profitable profitability for the fishermen in the industry. Mm. Well, Peter, we're talking about this because there's supposed to be a formal event, right? Yes. Among the world environment. Yes. It's happening right now at uh, OEB at the Valley View University. The president is, is going there this okay. morning. It's a talk program? Um, it's more or less like a We like too many talk programs. Um, it's a deba, but of course, um, the World Environment Day is not just a one-day uh, event. I mean, it's a whole series of uh, packed activities. But of course, we have a particular day to launch it. Today is so the today is the launch, okay. which the president will be doing. But this year, apart from the team that is the, the, the partners have identified in Ghana nationally, our team is looking at sustainable energy, and the focus is where, for waste to energy. You know, uh, <clears throat> we have the Sustainable Energy for All Action Plan. And the president in his State of Nation address announced uh, that we need to convert uh, um, 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 what do you call it, septic tanks of uh, educational institutions into biogas. Well, just so, one of the things he said. So that, 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 that's one of the major things Re that renewable we, energy is more than yeah, that. I so think. we no no, but we want to concentrate on that. You see, the issue about policy management is that you have many things, but you will have to take them step by step, one after the other. If you do that, then you can really see the impact than to do packets of activities here and there. So what we have decided is that, and that's also in our environment policy. So we have decided that no, once the president has focused on this area, let's try and see how much we can do so that we can really feel the impact. So there's going to be a lot of focus as far as our ministry is concerned this year mm. on that aspect of uh, renewable energy. The others, yes, we are working on them, but the focus as far as the team for this year is concerned is waste to energy which the president himself is going to announce. Mm. So once you're focusing on that, this one becomes secondary? No, it, does, it doesn't become secondary. In fact, um, energy is 
critical as far as all sectors are concerned. And even you need energy in terms of fisheries, mm -hmm. you know, fish processing, fish storage, and many other things that you need to do in the fishing industry. You need energy. So if you want to, 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 to get energy, and of course, if we're able to get energy for electricity, through the biogas for the for the for the for the for the tertiary institutions and then we are able to conserve energy in the national grid then we are able to get energy to do the other things fish processing we're going to get we're going to get energy to store fish and all that so it is interlinked and you cannot do any of them separately but the focus like i'm saying this year for us as a country and as a ministry is on energy and we are looking at waste to energy mm. well sam well, i was just going to say the other thing is you can't eat a whole fish in one bite you need to go at it bite by bite and yes. so for the government to start with identify uh, an achievable objective that will be able to then hopefully encourage others to, mm. to work on it as well so. w w w when you sit at your desk and yes. you tend to do you analyze all the data you have at what point then do you say well we have this and this program uh, with the government of ghana mm. and so well we need to do some monitoring and evaluation so and <laughs> I think that, again, that my, my job is on the diplomatic side. So that's really, it's USAID that has the projects that do, they, do they that. They deal they, with the specifics. They, do, they deal with the, the specific with, projects. Yeah, actually implementing projects and programs that involve resources. Mm. And my job is more to work with the government of Ghana, deliver messages to them and Almost take their like messages. Almost like a liaison activity. Exactly, exactly. I'm much more of a communicator and what, a facilitator. What, 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 what is a new activity now that you're so, dealing with in so, relation to? Well, in, in, in relation to climate change, again, we're working very closely with them. The preparations for Paris are have seized yeah. everybody around the world. Um, environmental ministries everywhere in West Africa and Central Africa, in Africa as a whole, and in the entire world are working on this, trying to create a plan for their emissions and how, where they're going to be cutting their emissions. And so one of the big jobs right now that I have is to go around to countries, tell them about what the U.S. has done, which is to uh, commit to cutting our emissions by uh, 26 to 28 percent from our 2005 levels. So basically t bringing down our emissions and then encourage other countries to create achievable goals to do the same, but mm. also goals that are, are, are substantial because, um, you know, you don't That's why you have the difficulty with China because they are not committed to it. Well, we but we're not here to discuss okay, yeah. right. <laughs> You're a diplomat, so I need to keep you on the fences. Uh, but, but, but as far as we're concerned, climate change is critical. Yes. How has that been factored into right. this whole project of making mm -hmm. sure that um, naturally we're supposed to be having mangrove um, areas and yes. and they are supposed to be linked to wetlands and Ramsia sites etc mm -hmm. now as they're being depleted and fish stock is also being depleted uh, how are we mm -hmm. supposed to make sure that the communities that are, uh, are the sufferers get to realize that mm -hmm. well there's a difficulty yeah. and then they need to have a certain target message on them right well I mean there's a lot of ways that climate change is going to impact on coastal communities uh, first you know the t temperature of the ocean is increasing and that will decrease the productivity of the oceans and which will mean here in Ghana most of the scientists believe that there will probably be less yields in the future so if that is the case we need to make sure that we can try to sustainably manage uh, what we can to make sure we can get as much as we can out of it but you know getting back to the uh, topic of renewable energy for instance in the event in Winneba uh, tomorrow there is a Ramsar site out there in the Winnie Lagoon and the uh, 1,000 mangroves will be planted there. So by planting mangroves, that helps uh, sequester carbon, but it's also important that we protect those mangroves because uh, Ghana has, uh, like the forest resources, they've been in decline, the area of mangroves. So by getting the communities involved, I think what we're trying to do is say, uh, mangroves are important uh, both to sequester carbon and reduce kind of hopefully uh, the impacts of climate change which is caused by carbon emissions but that they can also use those mangroves sustainably so if we're careful and we consume in a responsible way um, you cutting those mangroves to use for fuel wood for smoking it is a renewable energy so as long as they're replanting as long as they're cutting and doing sustainable harvest they can have zero impact uh, so that's part of the message as well. Mm. You should tell him that uh, the mangrove and Ramses sites 
from Sakumono right down through to have been depleted. They've been used to, as real estate development land. You yes. should tell him that. Mm. Uh, but areas that have already mm. been encroached upon, mm. what do you do about it? Well, that's a problem. I mean, if they've already been converted, it's, pre it's very difficult uh, to go back. So I think one thing is protect the resources that you still have. And in some cases, like in Winneba, they actually are, you can do reforestation. So if there are, have been areas that have been degraded, we can go back and we can replant them mm. and try to uh, increase the hectareage that we have of mangroves mm. uh, where it's capable. But in all cases, it's not possible. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm not the expert, yeah. though, but I can ask questions. <laughs> sure. And then you can forgive me if I ask yeah, a no, very, a very lame yeah. question. I don't know yeah. how regulation and enforcement also tend to start with this. I, I, I'm thinking it's a lame question. No, you're talking about the Ramsar? Yeah, um, definitely. Yes, yes. Uh, um, regulation as to, the, 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 as far as uh, sustainability yes. of environment linked to climate change yes. and with the whole objective of making sure we achieve what we're expected to achieve. For example, we're supposed to go to Paris and make sure we present good papers and, <laughs> and say we did well as a country. And uh, Not only did well, but what we are expected to do in sure. the near future is so what we are going to present. But then if you look at the Ramsar, that, that's the problem with environmental management. You see, the Minister of Environment or the EPA is in charge of general environmental management. But then there are institutions, specific institutions in charge of various activities. If you look at the Ramsar side, and I'm not shifting blame, um, it's supposed to be managed by the Forestry Commission nah. and the Wildlife Division. Shifting blame. We, we, what we do uh, is uh, to, to ensure that uh, all conventions that are environmental uh, are kind of uh, internalized uh, in various national institutions to make sure that they carry out the activities. But then each of these activities, like I'm saying, each institution has its mandate. So the Forestry Commission, but I know they are doing a lot. They have some challenges, and I'm not here. I don't want to always be talking about challenges because people are fed up of listening to challenges, but there are actual inherent challenges in there in managing the, the Ramsar side. But it's also attitudinal and commitment. You know, if you go to the Ramsar side, you will see a very conspicuous signpost in there that tells you that you shouldn't encroach and that this is a well, reserved area. I remember but 25 years ago, I, where I saw these very signposts you're talking about. They, they, not, they are now occupied by plush buildings. So, that, that's the yeah. commit, so that, that is the commitment as a country. I don't even want to own one of those buildings. Uh -huh. But I know they are not in safe ground. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, when, and when the assemblies attempt to, to pull down those buildings, you are in this country, you see what happens, the reaction, you see. Well, you don't, you don't stand country. your ground if and, you stand your ground. And, 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 and so it's a systemic issue which must be dealt with in a certain way. It has to be dealt with right from the top to the bottom. And everybody, including individuals, if you know that this area is a reserve area and you are not expected to go and acquire land there, in the first place you don't do it. Okay, that is where that's what is done in all countries. It's not all the case that you need the policeman to stand there with the whip to make sure that. He, I mean, yeah. that once we have made that known to you and you are aware, you don't even do that for us to pull it down and then all kinds of issues come on, on, on that. Yeah. So that's there are inherent challenges. But I'm saying it's systemic and must be dealt with holistically. You have to look at the institutions. You also have to look at people who have influence in society. You have to even look at local authorities because local authorities tell people this is our land. Even though they know very well the government has acquired it and it's a reserve area. And there are, it is quite complicated. But of course, as public institutions, it's our duty to ensure that the right thing is done. And I'm, thinking, I'm saying that a lot of... Uh, <coughs> Work is ongoing behind the scenes because mm. if you look under uh, the the, car the FLECTI, which is the Forest uh, Law and Enforcement uh, uh, Program that uh, Forest Commission is currently implementing, the issues of protecting wetlands is, is very crucial. And, I think uh, uh, I think it's really important to get getting the, the police, the communities. Okay, involved. we have the laws. We're not enforcing. So yeah. you let the yeah, I, I think it's very important to get the local communities involved because you know the government only has so many uh, resources. But I think if uh, communities and the people that live around the wetlands and the mangroves, if they understand the importance and how they provide functions such as uh, flood protection, as uh, nursery grounds for the fish stocks that they rely on, for the wood supplies that they use to smoke their fish, then they can also play a role in kind of public uh, protection of those uh, common property resources as well. You want to tell us something? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and talking, you know, yeah. to follow on what my colleague Peter is saying here is that uh, there are a number of people who have responsibilities for working against this, including the media and I think what you're doing here today is a good first step but for the media to concentrate on these are issues that impact every Ghanaian and these are impact they impact them in very severe ways as we saw on Wednesday night and so for the media not to just pick these things on World Environment Day 
and not just when a bad thing happens. So she, but we, to, we invest, need to, to we, investigate. We need to be consistent over time. Consistent, too. but also to be proactive. Thorough. Okay. To be proactive, to investigate when you can, to get your people out on the ground, yeah. looking at this, going out to the wetlands and seeing where construction has happened in the wetlands, and then following that chain back and see why that happens and then reporting on it. I think that's key for the media. And as the media works on these issues, those will be one of the things that really help to support the government when they go out and try to, um, to stop the activities, is having people know about this stuff. All right. Um, when are you going for the conference? When am I, 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 unfortunately, I don't get to go to Paris. Paris is in December. So, so the, but, but the, it's in the, it's the first two weeks of December. Um, Ghana will have a very competent and I, I believe a relatively large team there. Yes. And Peter can tell a little bit more about that. But they've got big plans. Do you know whether you're going yet? Or by November, you know? No, no, no. We are, we are, we are, are you we are, going? Yes, I am. You're part because, of the delegation? Yes, I'm part of the delegation. But I'm leading the process. It's yeah, always important. The preparation of the intended national determined contributions, which we are going to present. I am currently leading the process ah. here. And there's a whole big team that is working on, on what we have to present. And of course, the president yeah. will be there to currently disclose it. And then uh, other ministers of state, of course, the key institutions that will make sure that they will mm. all this. On well, the, Brian, on the let me give you the last word. If you were Ghanaian, I, I, I needed to be addressing you, Dr. Crawford. <laughs> so, well, Brian is okay for That's me. Fine. Yeah. You're, not, you're not too bothered about no, the qualification, yes, are you? Yes, uh, but you, you, you have the last word. <laughs> Do you think, for all intents and purposes, at the end of the five years, you, you, you would have achieved something meaningful? Do you see that futuristically inside? I do, and I wouldn't be here in Ghana and devoting a couple of years of my life to living here if I didn't think we could accomplish something. And I think there is great hope. Um, people understand what the problems are. I think there is great uh, talent and capacity here, so hopefully with some added support from USAID and the American people, uh, we can make a difference. And we're going to try to do that tomorrow in Winneba. You can come and join us if you want. And we're going to plant some uh, mangroves and uh, do greater awareness campaigns among the community about why it's important to maintain those uh, environment and how that can help sustain our livelihoods in the future. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. It was good to have you uh, in the studio. I'll call the two of you up. Perhaps we can um, do a lot more environmental chat uh, over some beer and more so palm wine. Have we done palm wine? I, I have, I have. I, have. Yeah. I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you like it? Tend to and like some it. some as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. appeal. <laughs> we'll call it appeal. <laughs> All right. And so uh, my guest for the morning and um, uh, Brian Co uh, Crawford. PhD. Uh, many of you are not used to the PhD at the end. Dr. Brian Crawford. <laughs> and uh, he is uh, with uh, USAID. Uh, we call it usually USAID and um, Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Projects and uh, at the Coastal Resources Center. Thanks for joining us. Thank and you. also just close by here is Sam Healy, is First Secretary, Regional Environment Science and Health Officer for West Africa as well as Central Africa and actually uh, has oversight responsibility for some 24 countries in those areas. And a man who will be going to that very conference in Paris uh, by close of the year, December 2015, is the man himself, uh, Peter Derry, is also the Deputy Director Head, Climate Change and Sustainable Development Unit, the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation. Good. When did we add that one? Yeah, I am. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. It's not quite <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll talk so about it next time. Uh, <laughs> we're taking a break. When we come back, we'll have a lot more for you. <laughs>